what they do and uh, just the, they're the hands and the feet of, of you, Jesus, and they're there to, um, to love on these people that uh, need to, to feel and to know that, uh, um, God, first of all, you love them, that you died for them and gave your life for them, Jesus. And, uh, and then there's, there's people here that um, love them and want to welcome them into our communities and uh, help them in uh, this transition in their lives. So uh, just pray for a special blessing and favor over that ministry and continue to provide volunteers for them and um, all that they need, uh, God, to continue to uh, be um, just a light in this community, we pray. So we just pray that many would come to know you as Lord and Savior through this ministry, Lord. And God, as we look into your word today, we just ask that you would draw us to your heart, uh, that we would know you more, that we would uh, draw near uh, to you, Lord Jesus, and, and receive all that you'd have for us today. So we speak blessing now over this time in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Well, if you'd open up your Bibles to the Gospel of John, we're going to look there this morning uh, is where we left off. John chapter 18, verse 28 is where we left off. And uh, last week, um, we finished up there with uh, Jesus was before the, uh, the chief priests and uh, also Annas. And uh, Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at the time who used to be a high priest himself. Um, and we finished up with Peter's denial of Jesus there in verse 27. And, and so the other uh, uh, gospels talk about some different things that happen in, in regards to appearing before Caiaphas. Uh, and Matthew and Luke uh, speak about those uh, appearances before Caiaphas. And one appeared at night before him and the other appeared in the morning. And so uh, John kind of skips right over that part and focuses on uh, the appearance here before Pilate. Uh, so we kind of fast forward now to the, the day of Passover, right? And it's the day that Jesus is going to be um, taking up that cross and going to dying for, for us and for the sin of the world. And so he's going to appear now before Pilate in verse 28. Uh, let's pick it up there. He says this, then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So I think there's a, a little hint of, of sarcasm here by John. As, uh, remember last week we talked about how the Jewish uh, leaders in the, the uh, Sanhedrin there, they they disobeyed all their laws, right? They were having a trial at night. Uh, they didn't have witnesses come for Jesus, which would be the, the normal thing to do. It was a Passover. They wouldn't normally have a trial uh, at Passover. This would be against their rules. And Jesus was an innocent man. And so here, they're worried about right, defiling themselves as they enter into Caiaphas's praetorium there. And John says they did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled but might eat the Passover. So this would be simply the location where Pilate does his uh, work. So this would be his place where he would uh, uh, oversee and his commander command there at the praetorium. And he would uh, do his daily business there at the praetorium. And so let's read on in verse 29 here. 29 to 33, read here to, with me this morning. It says, Therefore Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said to him, we are not permitted to put anyone to death, to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. Okay, so Pilate appears before them here, went out to them just outside of his area to meet them, and uh, 
And he asks them, what accusation does he bring against this man? And they answer him, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him to you. In other words, we're, we wouldn't waste your time, Pilate, unless this was serious. We're here because this man is an evildoer. And isn't that interesting that they call Jesus evil? <laughs> Can you think of what Jesus did to deserve that label? <laughs> All he did was bring life, bring healing, bring deliverance, bring freedom, bring salvation. This is who Jesus was. It says in the word, though, it says, Woe to those who call good evil, call evil good. We see that today in our own culture. People are calling good evil and evil good, and certainly right here, this is what they are doing as they look at Jesus and call him an evildoer. Now, there was a law that was in the books there for a period of time in Judea where the Jews could not kill someone themselves. They had to, to go before the Roman authorities and submit to them. And this is what they're talking about here is they come to Pilate asking for him to make judgment of this. And you can kind of already start to see Pilate wants to wash his hands of this. He doesn't want to uh, be involved in this necessarily. Take him yourself and deal with him yourself according to your law. But I think the, the Jewish leaders here realize that Pilate was the right man to bring this to. He was known for being cruel, for being very wicked. <laughs> if we remember back to the Gospel of, of Luke, I think it's Luke chapter 13, it speaks of the instance when Pilate killed many of the worshipers there that were worshiping there at the Temple Mount. So he was known for being a hard man, a ruthless man, someone that they could take this to and, and hope that he would go along with what they were wishing, and that would be to kill Jesus. Now, the Gospel of John doesn't mention here, but the, the Jewish leaders also appeal to Pilate's pride, and this is in Luke chapter 23, verse 2. He says this, in Luke 23, 2, he says, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so they brought witnesses and they brought people to twist the words of Jesus to say, Look, Pilate, he's disobeying you. He's disobeying Caesar. He's telling people not to obey and, and recognize Caesar as the ultimate authority. And so they appeal to Pilate's pride in that. They also probably are hoping to, to put a curse on Jesus. It says in the scriptures that to die on a tree is a curse. For Judah to die on a tree was a curse. So they knew how he would be executed under Roman authority, and that would be the cross. As it says here in verse 32, to fulfill the word of Jesus, which he spoke, signifying by what kind of death he was about to die. We've been speaking about the last several weeks about the, the contrast between Peter and Jesus and Peter thinking everything was falling apart, all these things that were happening on, on Jesus and the disciples and the peace of Jesus. The peace of Jesus through all this. Even the very details on how Jesus was to die has been foretold in the scriptures. Things weren't falling apart, were they? They were falling into place. And as Jesus says in John 3, he said, as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up from the earth, that he will draw all men to himself. Jesus was to be lifted up just as Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness, that all who would 
look to him and trust in him would be saved. Amen? Prophecy fulfilled. Let's read on. Verse 33. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? Okay, so again, this is kind of the, the second meeting here of Pilate and, and Jesus. And again, the other gospels share about what happened in between this meeting, and that was that Pilate delivered Jesus over to Herod, if you remember that. So he took Jesus and sent him to Herod, and Herod spent some time mocking Jesus, dressing him up, right, and ridiculing him in that. And then Herod sends him back to Pilate. Some people say about the, the scriptures and the gospels, they said, well, look at all the discrepancies. Look at all the um, contradictions in the scripture. That's, that proves that the Bible isn't true. It's quite the opposite, isn't it? Right? If, if the gospel writers wanted to, to come up with a story, they would all come together and decide we have to write the same things in the same language, right? They would conspire to, to write the same things if they were making things up. But John, his purpose is he's being led by the Holy Spirit, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write what he's writing, amen? And to focus on this meeting with Pilate is what he is doing. So quite the contrary. We realize the, the, the Gospels go together. There's no contradictions. There's no discrepancies. There's different focus and different points of view from the Gospel writers being inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the more we look at that, the more we're going to realize God's breath is on each and every word. Amen? All Scripture says is God breathes. So he focuses on this meeting with Pilate. And it's an interesting conversation he's having here. So we mentioned that, that passage from Luke about Jesus being a king and maybe as they twist his words saying not to pay taxes to Caesar, but if we remember Jesus' words, that was quite the opposite. He said, pay to Caesar what is Caesar, pay to God what is God's. But he asked this question, and I think it's in a mocking manner. Are you the king of the Jews? I mean, think about what's happening here. Jesus is being handed over by all the highest leaders of the Jews. Right? These, these Pharisees, these scribes, these, these leaders in the Sanhedrin are handing over Jesus to Pilate, saying, you need to take care of this for us. He's an evildoer. He needs to be killed. And this is their king. I mean, think about what Pilate's thinking here. You're the king of the Jews, and they want you dead. Jesus says, have you said this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? He says, I am not a Jew. Am I your own nation? And the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? In other words, Jesus, what did you do that is so bad? And he should have stayed on that, that train of thought. If he would have pursued that, maybe he would have rationally been able to say, this man is just done good. And he's even going to come to that conclusion. He finds no guilt in him, but he should have pursued that even further. Let's read on in verse 36. Jesus answered him, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Amen. Did you get that? His kingdom is not of this world. <laughs> it's of another realm. 
Jesus came to free this world, amen? To die for the sin of this world that they would be rescued. To die on that cross. Let's look at Pilate's response here in verse 37. He says, Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And again, I think he says this mockingly. You're a king? Look at what Jesus says. You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. He's mockingly responding to Jesus. And we could see that because in just a few moments they're going to beat him and they're going to give him a crown of thorns mocking him on his head. If Pilate really wanted to know what truth is, well, the truth was staring him right in the face. Jesus came for this very purpose, though. Did you see that in verse 37? For I am a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world. Have you ever heard anyone say, well, they were born for this? You know, this person's been born for this, born to be president. You know, it was about, there was a rabbi that said to Harry Truman, he was the president that was the first to declare that Israel is a nation. And a rabbi came into his office and said, you were born for this. You were put in your mother's womb for this very moment. But there was a beginning to Harry Truman, right? He was born and he began. Jesus was literally sent by his father. There was no beginning for Jesus. He's the Alpha, the Omega. He is from eternity. He was sent by his father for this very purpose. And notice what he says here. For this I come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to me or hears my voice. Truth was on trial, wasn't it? Truth was on trial in this very moment. What truth? As Pilate says, what is truth? You know, in this culture that we live in today, that's the, the thought. People laugh and mock, what is truth? It's all relevant. Well, I have my truth, you have your truth. That doesn't really work for me, does it? This works for me. Anyone ever get that response? My truth? Well, my truth? <laughs> There's no such thing as my truth. There's only truth. Reality. And reality is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So what truth is Jesus coming and testifying to, as he says here. Well, you know, those two that were on the road to Emmaus, remember when Jesus appears after his resurrection with those two on the road? He has a meal with them there, breaks bread with them. It says that their hearts were burning as they gave a, an account of what happened in that moment. Their hearts were burning within them. Their eyes were opened. What caused that? The truth. Jesus began to speak to them. It says about Moses and the prophets. All those spoke about him. Moses and the prophets. Do you know what we call that? The Old Testament. <laughs> Moses and the prophets. The scriptures. 
Jesus opened up the scriptures to them. So when he was there testifying to the truth, he was affirming, just as he did throughout his whole ministry, what Moses spoke about, what the prophets spoke about, foretelling of him and his coming, the Messiah. I find that when people, that people that diminish the Old Testament and the, the Word of God think little of, of Jesus, they might say, well, no, I, I, I agree with Jesus' words. I affirm what he said, but I just can't believe these, these things in the Old Testament. I think these things can't be trusted and believed. But if you say that, then you're discounting what Jesus is saying right here in this moment. <laughs> He's the one testifying to this truth <laughs> that Moses and the prophets foretold of me. Amen? So when we think highly of God's word, we think highly of Jesus' testimony. It says the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You know, there's a, a passage in John 8, 31 and 32. You don't have to turn there, but just listen to what happens. And Jesus is talking about this progression to his disciples. And he says, if you continue in my word, abide in my word. That, that means live in his word, right? Continue, abide, stay there, live there, grow there. The word is dwelling in you richly. He says, if you do this, you will be my disciples indeed. That's the proof. You want evidence that we're his disciples? It's that we continue in his word. We abide in his word. We listen to him. Do you notice what Jesus said here? Those who, everyone who is of the truth or who listens to me is on the side of truth. The implication there is there, there's sides, isn't there? Well, the other side is discounting Jesus. They're believing lies. They've replaced the truth of, of the Lord with a lie in their life. So if you continue, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Do you see the progression there? <laughs> How important is it to continue and to abide in his truth? You know, it, it warns, and Jesus warns, over and over in the Gospels. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do you think he's concerned about his disciples and his church being deceived? Yes. See, the world is already deceived. The world has bought a lie. The world has refused to believe and to trust. But he's concerned for his, his church, his disciples. And we can be taken captive, as it says in Colossians. He says, do not be taken captive by these hollow philosophies, the lies of the enemy in this world, the principles of this world. And how we do that is abiding in his truth. Amen? How many are glad that Jesus stood before Pilate in that moment and testified to the truth? <laughs> Because we can, we can be affirmed and we can be strengthened and we can know that his word and every jot and tittle will be fulfilled in him. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's stand and pray today. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your testimony, Jesus. God, in a world that So many lies. This prince of this world is out to steal, to, to kill and destroy, to take people captive in their lives. And so, Jesus, we 
stand here today and, and ask God, that we would walk in your truth, that we would abide in your word, that we would remain in your word day by day. God, you have given us the truth. You have testified to the truth, and you have given us your Holy Spirit that we might walk this out day in and day out. Thank you for the counselor who guides us and leads us in all truth. We recognize that there are so many lies and so much deception in our, our day, and people are calling good evil, and they're calling evil good, just as they did on that day of the cross. So help us to discern these times that we're in, to discern the lies that are being flooded out there, and to, to fight that with the truth, for your word is truth. We love you and we thank you for each one today. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you yet as Lord and Savior, let today be the day. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Not one is righteous. The wages of that sin is death. We deserved death. But the free gift of God is Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, may they receive that free gift today. It says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so, Lord, we just give a moment here for anyone here at home watching right now that they would call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. They would repent and turn from their sin, turn from the lives of this world, turn from the sinful nature and trust you, Jesus Christ, to come and, and save them heal them, to be born again, to be born from above. And when we do that, we confess you as Lord and believe in our heart that you were raised from the dead, you give us your Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have given us today. We bless each one. We pray continued favor over Compass International and, and that tremendous ministry in town here and provide everything that they need to continue to advance your kingdom in this community. We bless your name and ask this all now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.